Once again, welcome to our Wednesday night devotional and Bible class. Good evening to all of our church family, extended family, and all of our friends that are watching tonight. We deeply appreciate you as we use this vehicle for a time until we can get back together in the building as we did before. I'm very thankful to Michael Lester for providing this opportunity for us to extend our Bible study to you and to all those that watch, and we thank God for this opportunity. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, thank you, Father, for the blessing you give us in life. Help us understand your will in our lives now, Father. Help us to be help to other people, Father, that are hurting. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I was very grateful to Russ recently when he taught the First Thessalonians chapter 2 letter. It was a wonderful lesson. And I like to hear people that make me think. In the last two verses of First Thessalonians chapter 2 did that for me in his lesson. I invite you to open your Bibles to First Thessalonians chapter 2, the last two verses, 18 and 19. And as you do, I, I would call this little thought tonight, Satan working overtime. A lot of people are still out of work. Children will be out of school for months. A lot of people are out of sorts and some out of their minds when it comes to this pandemic and this social unrest. And the problem is a lot of people want to blame God. I want to blame godliness in our world. That's the problem. And in fact, it's the solution. Blaming God for something that he didn't do. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. As the beginning of God's creation for two chapters, in the third chapter, Satan's introduced to us. And as Satan's introduced to us, he's already pulled out his toolbox. He's using all of the tools he has in his box. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life to dupe Eve. We don't blame Satan when we sin. James 1 says we sin by our own lust, but Satan does put it in our pathway. And as a result, man sins. They have to leave the garden and begin to live a life full of the consequences of Satan and sin in the world. Sickness, death, and unrest. These come from Satan, not God. And right now, I think we all would agree, it looks like Satan is working overtime. And because of that, we can become wondering if God is there and God cares. In our text tonight, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and in verse 19, notice what he says, actually verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. He understood the problem. God is all-powerful, but Satan is also just as real as God. He's not all-powerful, but he is powerful. And he hinders us. He puts barriers, hurdles in our way. He gives us discouragement and disappointments and all the sin and sickness and sorrows that we're facing now is from Satan, not from God. Paul says, Satan has hindered me. Please note, he didn't say stop me. He's hindered me. During this pandemic, uh, it might be easy to think that, God, are you still there? Do you care in my life? Has the church forgotten me? Have I fallen through the cracks? Just the opposite. Even though we haven't been able to meet together as a whole body as yet, we are still a whole body in Christ. And everyone is important. Please now look at verse 19. Paul says, for what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing. Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? You know human nature. And it seems like Paul is saying here in verse 18, 
that maybe you might think I don't think you're important. That's why I haven't come to you yet. That you're down on my list. You're not a priority. Not the case at all. Paul says, you are so precious to me. Every member is my joy, Paul says, is my crown. That's the way it is in ministry. The greatest thing that can happen to us is to be able to go to heaven. The second greatest thing that can happen to us is to take people with us. And that's ministry. And can you imagine that judgment day as you're ready for your turn and you see someone that you have helped to come to the Christ and they hear from God, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you a ruler over many things. Enter the joy of your Lord. And then you hear those same words. And throughout eternity, of course, the greatest blessing will be to see him face to face, to be with him. But maybe the second most important and greatest thing is to be with all of the saints and to have people time and again throughout eternity point to you and say, there's the one that brought me to the Christ. I am here because of them. What a joy. What a crown. And so he says here in verse 20, for you are our glory and joy. Does God care? Is God there? Satan's working overtime on you. Because in your better moments, you know he is. In fact, because someone brought you to the Christ, you now know forgiveness. You now have a relationship with God and the church family. You now have your chance to have your sins forgiven by simply praying to him. Because you were baptized into Christ, he initially washed away those sins and now through that same blood, James 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And while Paul was in a Philippian jail, he could say in verse 19, my God should supply all of your needs in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We praise God. Can you, I can't even imagine what this time must be like for people who don't know God, who don't have Jesus in their lives. I don't even know how to respond to that, except to want to help them to understand God, to know God, to respond to him in a baptism and have Christ in their lives and be part of his church family and to know what you and I know. Oh, we get discouraged, but we have God on our side. We have Jesus God and the Holy Spirit in us. We have his word. We have the church family. Oh, Satan's working overtime. Don't let him work overtime on you. And when he does, you can do as they did in the Bible. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, talking to Peter, one of his loyal followers. He meant well, but he wasn't doing what God would have him to do. He was discouraging the Lord. And the Lord said, no. Get behind me, Satan, discouragement. You can listen to Jesus. He says that God's going to bruise Satan's head shortly. You can listen to the Bible. It tells us in Revelation chapter 20 that when the Lord comes again, Satan and his angels will be cast into a lake of fire. But those who are right to heaven with him for eternity. We all are saying right now that it's, we're going to get through this, and we are with him. It's going to be better in the future, and it will be in him. And that we can make it, and we can, in him. Don't let Satan work overtime. He's working overtime because he's not as powerful as God. God is going to be victorious in the end. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are overcomers through him. Keep that in your mind. Let's pray again. Well, I thank you for this lesson from your word. Satan is working overtime, but you're more powerful than Satan. We put our trust in you. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. This is Stephen Guy from the Myrtle Beach Church of Christ with a word of encouragement. May God bless you and keep you.
Let's sing 892, The Steadfast Love of the Lord. 892. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. The steadfast love the of the steadfast Lord, love never, of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come His to an never end. Never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. Therefore I will hope in Him. Good evening, guys. It's time to begin our class study tonight. We are actually starting 2 John. I can't believe that. Uh, we finished 1 John last week. It was the fellowship barometer. And once again, John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John are written by the Apostle John, whom we know as the Apostle of Love. And, you know, when you think about John, it's just something incredible to think about. He actually touched Jesus Christ. He actually listened to the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. He was in Christ's inner circle. And to me, that's amazing. And we're going to study 2 John tonight. We might get through some of it, might get through all of it. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, but we're going to start with a prayer. And I want to let you guys know I miss you and I can't wait to see you. I love you. And uh, these are written by the Apostle of Love. And as I was studying this, it just makes me, it reminds me of how much I love you guys and I miss you. And I'm so ready for all this mess to be over. But at least we have this means, this technology that we can still worship and study together. And uh, let's start with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Father, we ask that you guide our hearts and our minds in study and in fellowship and, and worship of your word and Father, help us to study in spirit and in truth. Father, help us to take what we learn from these pages and apply it to our lives. And Father, to take action and to go out into the community and to bring others to you. Father, I love you and I praise you. And, and please be with our congregation. Be with those that are sick and those that truly need your hand on them, Father. Be with those that are discouraged, those that are depressed because of being have, having to stay inside. Father, please take this sickness from our land. We love, we praise you. And Father, once again, I pray that you be with our elders as, as they're having to lead and shepherd this flock through this unprecedented time. Father, we love and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. It's time to begin first, or I'm sorry, Second John. The theme of Second John. Remember this. Rosemary, remember this. The theme of Second John is what? No, Doug. It's it's not the fellowship barometer. Because that was first John. Yes, you're right, Rosemary. It's this theme is close the door. All right, can you guys do that with me? Close the door. All right. That's the theme of Second John. Can you guess what the theme of third John will be? It's going to be open the door. All right. So let's remember this. Let's repeat this one more time. The theme of second John is close the door because we're wanting to and john is trying to teach his loved ones in the church and us today to close the door on false teachers and false doctrine and we're going to study that tonight so the theme once again one more time doug <laughs> is to close the door all right so let's start with uh, verse one and we'll read all the way down through verse 6. And we're going to start to dissect these and break these down. Verse 1. 
the elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you have that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. All right, brothers and sisters, this is just the beginning of a very short epistle written to the elect lady. Now let's start to break this down. The very first two words, the elder. All right. Do we know if John was an elder in the church? We don't know. We don't know. We know he was an apostle, right? But there are numerous reasons why uh, he could have named himself the elder when he wrote this. You know, he was at this point, he was up in years. He was elderly. Um, he was an exceedingly old man. Um, and the relationship that he sustained with his readers was that of a, of a father counseling his children. Um, so as we read this, uh, according to, uh, the commentary, the Burton Kaufman commentary, and like I said, the, the commentaries are not the all, the end all be all, but according to Burton Kaufman commentary, the term elder is basically, he's referring to himself as the elder, the older man, uh, as a older person, not as much as the position of elder. So he is here called an elder because he was an old man. So he basically is saying from the old man to the elect lady, you know, he loved his children so much. He considered himself the old man, the elder. And I, I can see, I can just almost see the younger members of the congregation as they're sitting to worship, wherever they're, wherever they're worshiping. And there comes that old rascal. There, there comes John. You know, we all love the, our elderly in our congregation. You know, when we think about our elderly, we think of Jerry Moxley, you know, that old rascal, right? But what a wealth of knowledge that Jerry Moxley has in that 90 year old brain of his. He'll be 90 in December. And we, we all love Jerry. He's, he's stepped down as an elder, but he actually was an elder. And now he stepped down as that, but now he's elderly. But when I think of, of that term, that's what I think of. And, and the, the church loved John. And John loved his children. He called the church his children. That's how much he loved them. He was the apostle of love. All right, let's continue. To the elect lady. Now, there are two, I don't want to say divisions, or there, there are two arguments as to who he's writing to here. One of the arguments is that it's to a specific person, a, a woman whom he loved very much as a Christian, who had many children in, in the church. There's also another argument that the elect lady is the church. And that's my personal belief, because if you read in Revelation uh, chapter, I want to say it's chapter 12, it talks about the church in kind of that terminology. So my personal opinion is he's talking about Christ church to the elect lady. Others believe it's to a specific person, uh, a woman named Eclecte, the way they translate it from the Greek. It's one of those things we don't really know. But 
honestly, it doesn't matter because what we need to know is what he's telling this lady or this church. But I'm going to I'm going to teach it from the point that this is the church, because to me, it makes more sense to the elect lady, to the church and her children. Right. To the children in the church, because he loved his church family. So let's read that again to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth. Not just love, but in truth. What's he talk about in truth? In the truth of the gospel. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. What does he mean by that? When people come to Myrtle Beach Church of Christ to visit, and they go back home, they tell all of their church family, Guys, I love the Myrtle Beach Church of Christ because that is a church of love. There are so many people that come to this congregation because they know what a wonderful church family we have. They love our minister. They love our elders. They love our, our deacons and our, our members. They love that loves because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. They know that when they come to Myrtle Beach, they have a church home. Wherever they go, especially in Myrtle Beach. And that's what he's talking about here. And not only I, but also those who have known the truth. So all the others that are members of the church that know of you, love you. That's what he's talking about. Isn't that a beautiful sentiment? So he's writing to this church and the children of that church, whom he calls his little children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but every other congregation, all the other members of other congregations around, love you guys as well, because you are brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? It almost takes us back to the fellowship barometer, because that's how much we love, and we're, we're supposed to love. All right, let's continue. And second, chapter two, because of the truth which abides in us, and will abide with us forever. Now, that truth, once again, what is he talking about? The truth. The truth is a vivid or impressive description of the reason for the love each faithful disciple feels for all the other disciples. Have you guys ever been away from your church family for a long time? We all have, haven't we? Aren't you missing that church fellowship? I don't know about you guys, but I'm missing the love. I'm missing hugging and holding and being with you and laughing and fellowshipping with you guys. That's what he's talking about. Because those that have put Christ on in baptism, we have a special bond. We have that love one for another. And we're going to get on to that in, in just a little bit. Only those who have love for the truth, love in truth. Does that make sense? If you love the gospel of Christ and you have put Christ on in baptism, then you, you know true love. And that's what he's talking about. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. All right, guys. That takes me back to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ continually. That, that's the translation of that word. The, word the, the blood of Christ continually washes our sins away. Guys, that's what it means there. And we will abide and will abide with us forever. Can you imagine the feeling of love when we get to heaven? And fellowship together forever with no fears, no worries about COVID-19. We're not going to have to wear masks and gloves and be six feet separate. We're going to be fellowshipping in truth and love. That's what he's talking about there forever. I love that. And verse three, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God, the father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of the father in truth and love. Once again, there's the truth and the love. But he starts out with grace, 
mercy and peace. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? It does sound familiar. See, these words are often used together as a common greeting throughout the New Testament. We could go to Romans chapter 1. Let's go to Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. And just look at that. Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. Maybe that's the wrong verse. No, it's, it, it is verse 7. Okay. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, uh, of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. That sounded familiar, didn't it? Grace and peace. I love that. Here's another one. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, where these same terms are used. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And verse 2. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. See guys, when we are in the gospel, when we, when we are in his church, when we put Christ on in baptism, we have all those. We have grace we have mercy and we have peace. And I, I love how Burton Kaufman wrote this. Grace suggests the first approach, the loving disposition of God that he would give his only begotten son to a rebellious race. Mercy is grace expressing itself in action. Basically, God giving his son and Christ dying on that cross. And peace is the blessed condition of the heart once we've put Christ on in baptism. Do you guys remember the first time you raised out of that water in newness of life? When you put Christ on in baptism, the peace that you had, that you felt, that's what he's talking about. Isn't that beautiful? So verse three, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God, from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the Son of the Father, in truth and love. And once again, what's that truth? The truth is the gospel. The truth is everything that he's taught in truth and love. I love that. I love that. Verse 4. I rejoiced greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth. As we received commandment from the Father. All right. When you first read this verse, you think that, okay, I rejoice greatly that I found a few of your children root walking. So that makes you think that maybe there's some children that aren't walking in truth. But the more you study that, really all he's saying here is, I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth. The ones that I've come in contact with, they are all walking in truth. That's like people from other congregations seeing members of the Myrtle Beach Church of Christ out and about and coming back and saying, I have seen some of those members of the Church of Christ from Myrtle Beach and they are walking in the truth. They are walking in the light just as we were commanded to walk in the light. I love that. You know, he found such a great satisfaction because he thinks of them as his little children. Fathers, mothers, when you see your children doing good, doesn't that bring you a great satisfaction? It does. It really does. And he thinks of his church family, his the younger members of his congregation, as his children. I love that. His little children. And he was glad to know that they were still walking righteously, that they were still walking in truth, even when there was so much evil all around. Guys, it's just like today. You, you turn on the TV, there's so much evil going on in the world today. And yet the church is still here. It's still strong. You know, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Maybe it's chapter it's chapter 16, verse 
20 or 21. But the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The church will always be here. The truth will always be here. And I love that. These children were walking. They were literally living the life of truth. And the truth is, is the behavior. You know, it, it's not only an action, but it's a habitual action. They, a progression to a goal. And what's that goal? That crown of life to get to heaven. So it was an everyday conduct. They were walking in truth. And I love that. As we received commandment from the Father. And what was that commandment? Turn to 1 John. 1 John 1, 5 through 7. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. I'm way off. Okay, hang on. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the what? That's right, Dan Paul, the truth. That's right. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's beautiful. You know, there, there's so many other other verses we could use. First, first John 2, 7. Beloved, no new commandment I write unto you, but an old commandment, which ye have heard from the beginning. That old commandment is the word which we have heard. So once again, we've been taught. They, they know what they were supposed to be doing. I rejoice that I have found some of the children walking in the truth as we have received commandment from the Father. What was that? That you love one another as I have loved you. That's what it is. That you love your brother as yourself. That you love. Once again, it's love. Verse 5. And now I plead with you, lady. Uh, the Greek term was, I beseech you. That's even more strong than our term to plead. Beseech means to, to really, how do they say that? To petition, to strongly petition as one has a right to make based on this law of love. I beseech you, lady, or the congregation, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had one from the beginning, that we love one another. You know, once again, 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. And that is love each other. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. We are to love one another. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Let's read this. Verses 16 through 19. I'm sorry. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Brothers and sisters, we're to love each other that much for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children. Once again, John loves his, his church people like his little children. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. How do we know we're in the truth? By our love. What's that song we used to sing in, in Vacation Bible School? They will know we are Christians by our what? That's right, Jerry. By our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
All right, let's continue. Chapter 6. I'm sorry, verse 6. Verse 6. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Once again, guys, he's given us the commandments. We know the commandments. The commandment is to love one another, to be obedient to his commandments, to put Christ on in baptism. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, 27. If you want to be in Christ, we know that eternal life is found in Christ. Actually, if you go to uh, the page over, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Okay, so how do we get the son? Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27 tells us just that. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23. I'm sorry. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have what? have put on Christ. That's right, Drew. Good job. Absolutely. This is the commandment I have given you. You know, turn to John because, you know, John wrote John as well. Turn to John 13. John chapter 13 verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Guys, that's the words of Jesus Christ there. That's why this is so strong on the Apostle John's heart. That's why he's the Apostle of love. When he wrote this, he was the last living apostle. He was the last living uh, follower of Christ, of that inner circle. He knew love. He knew what love was about. He understood that commandment to love one another. Um, John 14. Let's read John. Let's go back to John chapter 14. I was there. Should have stayed there. John chapter 14. Verses 15, John chapter 14, verses 15, and then verse 21. I'm sorry, is that right? John chapter 14, verse 15. There you go. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep what? My commandments. Jesus is saying that. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by whom? By my father. Guys, it all comes full circle. You have to love to be able to understand the gospel and to be able to put Christ on in baptism. And when you grow in Christ, after you put Christ on a baptism, your love abounds and you love your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And that love continually grows and you yearn to be with your brothers and sisters. That's what it's all about. Let's read that last verse one more time. Verse six. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. The commandments we just read in John. That the words of Jesus. This is a commandment that you have heard from the beginning. Walk in it. That's what he's telling them. Live it. Breathe it. Every action of every day should be that commandment. Love. Guys, we're going to finish there tonight. I love you guys. I miss you. I can't wait to see you. I hope you'll study this. 
I hope next week we'll finish the second epistle of John. But one more time, uh, what's the theme of second John? It's close the door. And we're going to look at verse 7 through 13, and we're going to see why it's called close the door. See, this first part, he was talking about the love and edifying them and exhorting them to continue to love. Now we're going to see why he was doing that. Because of, there's false teachers out there. There's deceivers. And that's what we got to close the door on. All right. So we'll do that next week. Guys, I love you. And I'll see you next week.